I love the way that when these rooms fill up, the rows fill up from the end. It's like a church where you worry that the sermon's going to be a bit too long and you want to slip out early. Um, Yesterday, I think I had somebody leave after I'd been speaking for five minutes. I told myself they must be sick, but (laughs) I thought that the question of are we heading for a global recession is something which we might all kind of be interested in. And certainly, when we're putting these presentations and and, and roadshows together, I mean, it takes, as you can imagine, months of, of logistical planning, and I think it was probably two months ago that we came up with this topic that we thought might be interesting. And I did worry, oh, you know, what's going to happen if the world economy is accelerating and, and everything is kind of smooth sailing? But I uh, told myself, don't worry, Donald Trump is in charge in the US. And <laughs> What happens in the case of a global recession? What's the likelihood of a global recession? How are asset classes currently priced? Um, and what are the prospects then for our portfolios? But first, let's turn to Google, the world's most popular search engine, and see, are people looking for this question as to are we likely to be going into a recession. And here I'm looking at Google Trends. So this kind of shows the extent to which those searches are taking place, the China in the purple and and the US in the dark gray. We see the global financial crisis and the peak there in those searches. Um, But in particular, it's important, I thought, to note here that China itself, as people have been worrying about China going into recession now for three years, that started in 2015. So only more recently that interest as far as or concern has picked up as far as the U.S. is, is orientated. And Richard Poplack, our guest speaker, who will be the last of our four speakers, will be talking specifically about China. And I'll come back to that theme as well myself um, uh, later in my presentation. Why are we worried about a recession? It may seem obvious, but you know, I do think we, we need to set it in a historic context. This is the S&P 500, the price of the world's largest stock market, 50% of global equity market capitalization here in the S&P 500. Um, what happened in 2007, the most recent recession we recall, the market fell by 50%. So the horizontal axis on this chart is the months of economic contraction. So the timeline whilst the economy was actually contracting and then the price indexed to 100, a 50% fall. How typical is that of recessions? Well, we looked at every recession since 1960. So there are eight other periods of US economic contraction. What did the S&P do during those periods? Absolutely, there was a, the average fall in the, in, in the market was 15 to 20%. The global financial crisis was the longest period of economic contraction and the most severe in terms of the market. So we are anchored to the worst experience in post-war times in terms of our, our experience, but that's not to kind of minimize the kind of real wealth destruction that occurs if we see a significant global slowdown. And it's not just about wealth. There were effects on real people's lives. Whilst researching this, I came across an article in the medical journal, The Lancet, and it looked at the change in the US suicide rate, and the authors noted an inflection point around the time of the global financial crisis where there was a marked kink up. No doubt the reasons for this are complex. But the truth is that 30,000 more people have taken their lives in the US than the previous trend would have suggested. So there are real costs. Um, And in thinking about then the likelihood of recession, we need to understand what are the drivers for global growth. And those drivers are both structural and cyclical. The structural factors are long-term in nature. So, you know, often we're not aware of them on a day-to-day basis. They don't come at us hard and fast like the high-frequency news that we're exposed to, you know, online, in the Financial Times, in The Economist, or any of the myriad sources of, of information that come past our inboxes on a daily basis. So that's, those are the kind of more cyclical factors. Um, but I want to touch on a few of these and, and uh, opine on our, or at least present the prudential view of how important they are to set some context to what's driving global growth and then, uh, and then perhaps turn to um, whether there are any of the typical warning signs for an overheating economy. But before I look at these, some of these indicators, I think it's also important to set a context to the fact that the world we are in is changing. And again, this is going to echo to... Richard Poplack's talk in terms of um, the massive shift that is going on, um, particularly in terms of the rise of the East. This is 
a decomposition of world, world GDP by country over the last 2,000 years. Um, it's an astonishing piece of economic history in its own right. Today, I'm going to focus on the fact that India and China, India being the purple bar and China, um, China being the purple bar and India being the grey bar, India and China for 1,800 years of the last 2,000 years were 50 to 60 percent of world GDP. It's only been in the last kind of 200 years that we saw the rise of the G7 economies, the so-called advanced world, um, and that is now changing rapidly. We are shifting back to a world where the vector of growth is very firmly away from the advanced world. India and China together now account for as much of world GDP as the G7 combined. And so I make no apology for the fact that we will come again, back again a number of times to, uh, to look at China in particular and its impact. The first of my structural factors on that list of growth factors was debt. And here, looking at emerging markets as a whole and their indebtedness. And this is going to echo through into the presentation by Prudential's head of equity, which will follow mine, Jolene Lambridis, who's going to specifically, I think, go into the challenges of rising debt levels that it presents to companies and to countries. But if we just look at the general trends for emerging markets, this is indebtedness but from different sectors of the economy relative to GDP. So the red line, non-financial corporates, companies other than kind of banks and insurers, the, their level of indebtedness over the last 20 years has doubled from 50% of emerging market GDP to 100. And every other sector of the economy, of the emerging world, has increased its leverage. And that's important because one has to question how much can leverage continue to drive growth, particularly in a situation where we have a recession. As an aside, we can ask how does South Africa stack up against other emerging economies and have put them on the same scale so you can kind of read across. And actually, our private sector compares reasonably well. Our households have been deleveraging rapidly since 2007. Our banks and insurers have added no further leverage in the last 10 years. It's been in our government sector that we've seen that debt to GDP rise. And um, Johnny Lombridis will talk some more about um, some of the, I think, the challenges there. But suffice it, suffice it to say, at this point, I think the danger there is that governments won't be able to come to the party in the way that they have done previously and provide the fiscal stimulus that can be so valuable. Another thing that won't come to the party is global demographics. This is a very kind of slow-moving structural force, but incredibly important as a growth driver. So the bars, number of people in the world today and in, through time, on the left-hand axis in billions. So in 1950, there were 2.5 billion people on the planet. There are now 7.5 billion people forecast to be 11.5 billion people by the time we get to 2100. That has been a huge vector for global growth, particularly because if we look at the red line, which is the proportion of the global population that is of working age, age 15 to 64, then you can see from 1970 through to 2010, 2012, that proportion of the world population that was available to work was consistently rising. We, that has now peaked, and we are now on a downward trend. We might ask ourselves, well, is that not because the developed world is aging? And actually... If we break it down into both advanced economies, the dark gray line here, and the emerging world, the lighter kind of grayish line, they are both in a trend of deterioration as far as the proportion of the population available to work. And the emerging world is being driven by China, which is the pink line, or the purple line here. China peaked in about 2010 at 75% of its population, but the one-child policy will see by 2050 that falling from 75 to 55 China's aware of those challenges and it's doing something about it. And you'll hear more about that later. Another force that has been very important for China is the expansion of world trade. In the 1970s, there was essentially, I think, a, a tacit agreement to bring China and other Asian countries into the world trade system. 
and they benefited hugely from that enhanced access to the developed world, to developed consumers. And if you have any doubt about that, then look at Chinese GDP growth against that expansion in world trade. So Chinese GDP growth on the right-hand axis, world trade is a percentage of world GDP on the left-hand axis. So you can see world trade was about 25% of world GDP at the start of the chart back in 1960. It's peaked at about 60%, so you can imagine the compound growth rate relative to other components of GDP. The key point here is the last decade or so has seen world trade as a percentage of world GDP flatline at that 60% kind of level. And the result we can see, it's not the only factor clearly, but it's one of the forces that's leading to a slowing of Chinese growth. Can we rely on the modern-day wizards, the Gandalfs of our world, the Jerome Powells, the Mario Draghi's, the Mark Carney's, to come and save us, as they have done in the past with interest rate cuts? Cheap money, asset purchases. The challenge with that story is that if we look at 5,000 years of interest rates, we are at a 5,000-year low. So one might want to ask, how much further can that process go? You know, nobody really knows what's the effectiveness of QE. You look at Japan, Japan has been doing QE, not just in bond markets, buying its own bonds, but it's also a significant hold of its own equities. 70% of passive equity funds are running against the Japanese equity market owned by the Japanese government and a not dissimilar portion of the Japanese bond market, and yet there is no inflation in Japan, so what is going on? If I turn to perhaps some more positive factors, one I want to highlight is political regimes. This is a map of the world where the colors of the countries represent the political regime. Green is democracy, and there are good reasons why we should favor democracies as a driver of growth, because Democracies hold politicians to account, and it tends to mean that they adopt more capital-friendly, business-friendly, consumer-friendly policies. They want to get re-elected. There's also a kind of respect for property rights that exists in democracies for some fairly obvious reasons, whereas the blue here are colonies and the red are dictatorships. The colors in between are a bit of a mix. You can see 100 years ago, Africa was still under the yoke of the colonizers, and democracies were in fairly kind of lean supply. Flip forward to the end of the Second World War, the situation hasn't significantly improved. In fact, Russia's now under Stalin and has gone backwards. Africa remains much the same. 1970, Africa has swapped colonizers for dictators. Latin America is mostly under a dictatorship, as is much of Asia. The last 30 years have seen a sea change there. A significant rise in, um, in the rise of, of, of democracy across the world. And as I say, I think that's one of the factors that's helped global growth. If we look to now, there has been a little bit of a rollback. We're aware of that. Russia's rolling back. We see Putin rolling back democracy in, uh, there and in some African countries too. But overall, I would put this in my positive tick box. Also in the positive tick box is technology. Technology has just been astonishing. The left-hand chart, how many transistors can you fit on one microchip? In 1971, you could fit about 1,500 transistors on one microchip. You can now nearly fit 100 billion transistors on a single microchip. And where do we see that reflected? Well, in many parts of the economy, but importantly in productivity. Labor productivity continues to rise, and productivity is a key driver of long-term potential growth. Technology has another important effect. It brings down the prices of goods. So here we look at the stock of industrial robots around the world. There were essentially none in 1970. There are 2 million robots now estimated to be operational in the world today. Will, that is expected to double in the next four years to four million. Let's look at Euro, U.S. durable goods prices on the right-hand scale here. The year-on-year -year change has been negative, not just stable or low, been negative for the last 20 years. Your television today is costing you half 
what it did in nominal terms 20 years ago. Technology also offers the potential for leapfrogging forward in the path of economic development. The headlines along the top of this chart represent the traditional Economics 101 way in which emerging markets can move out of recession, um, uh, move, out, move along the development path, move from being an emerging market to an advanced economy. From a primary producer, you dig things out of the ground and you sell them to people who are going to make value-added products from them through to ultimately a service-led economy. And we can see a very clear relationship between real GDP per capita and where you sit in that advancement um, path. The important point here for me is if we look at some of those countries that are the drivers of current growth, we look at China and we look at India, for example, Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh, they're all sitting still with relatively low levels of real GDP per capita. There is a lot of open road available to them in terms of their ability to continue to grow and raise the living standards for their population. I want to turn now to the question of, are the classic warning signs of recession an imminent recession there? And here I'm going to look at US data. For one thing, we have some great history on US economic data. And secondly, it's, well, after China now, it's the world's second largest economy. This is US real GDP. Along the horizontal axis, the months of economic expansion. So we have been going now for nearly 10 years, 120 months. GDP has been consistently positive, but at a relatively modest rate. And let's put that into context. We look at the seven other periods of economic expansion since the 1960s in the US, and we can just see how rapidly the US emerged out of its previous periods of contraction into these expansionary phases relative to what happened in this particular cycle. So I'd look at this chart and I'd say, yeah, GDP's kind of been going up. It's been positive, but it has been very lackluster. And what about inflation? You know, a key concern for businesses, a key concern to the US Federal Reserve is if prices start to accelerate rapidly. The red line here, the current period of expansion, the same framework as the previous chart, it has been the lowest average inflation rate of any economic expansion since the Second World War. And we can see in quite a number of the previous expansions, inflation starts to kick up in the later parts of the cycle. Classic economics, demand pull, cost push inflation. Consumers chase, wealthier consumers chase Goods producers face higher costs. Now, one of the indicators, perhaps, that we might say, this is amber. You know, okay, David, you know, you've said, the, okay, maybe not GDP and maybe not inflation, but what about unemployment? Look at that. The largest fall in the unemployment rate in the US in any economic recovery, certainly in the last 60 years. 10% down to close to three and a half now, isn't that a warning sign? Why are we concerned about unemployment? We're concerned because as the labor market gets tighter, wages will start to push up and you'll get that cost pressure coming through. Except for the fact that when we look at wages and we look versus previous periods of expansion, we don't see that phenomenon manifesting itself. Certainly, there's been a positive upward trend. I mean, three years, three years into this expansion, wages were growing at, this is nominal wages, growing at zero. We're now growing at about two and a half to three. There's still, compared to previous cycles, an extremely constrained rate of growth. And as we saw, labor productivity is still rising, even if a little bit more slowly than it was before. So unit labor costs, incredibly contained. So I would suggests that there's limited evidence that the classic warning signs that would indicate an overheating economy, that would indicate a need for significant further interest rate hikes, for instance, from the Federal Reserve, that they don't seem to be there. <laughs>
And yet when we look at asset markets and ask, how are asset markets pricing this, these fundamentals? Because at Prudential, we don't forecast. We try and avoid the hubris of saying we know. We rather say, what is the fundamental backdrop? How do markets price that? And here, the bars represent the prospective real yield available from different asset classes. Global bonds and cash on the left-hand side in the gray bars. A selection of global equity markets on the right-hand side. The sort of grayish zone that feeds across the chart is Prudential's view of what you should be paid in real terms for those different asset classes given their inherent risks. What do we observe? And it's a little bit trite to say so. Global equities look fundamentally cheap. Global bonds, in many cases in the developed world, you are receiving a negative nominal yield. And most developed market bond yields are negative on a real basis. So you are going backwards, your wealth in real terms, kind of guaranteed. Some of the emerging market bond markets, I think, look more interesting. We're long South African bonds. Um, I think you look at 10-year um, bonds in South Africa, offering you a 9% yield. Inflation is currently sitting at 4%. It's a 5% real return. Even if we think inflation is going to pick up, that structural inflation in South Africa is maybe 5%. That still gives us 400 basis points of real yield. That is a very significant return to investors over the medium term. But the real juice in terms of returns sits in global equities. And so if we look at markets where Prudential is overweight, both in its local and global portfolios, it's some of those higher yielding global equity markets, as well as some local currency emerging bond markets. But no one valuation indicator should ever be sufficient. Forming a view of markets and Potential returns is like a jigsaw puzzle, and you need to put the pieces together, gather as many as you can. You'll never have the whole puzzle. Sometimes I think it's like one of those thousand-piece puzzles that serious jigsaws, jigsawers do that are just one color. And um, that's a massive challenge. But if we look at some other indicators of value, and I'll have two further ones to present to you. Price to book. How much are you paying for the book value of the assets on companies' balance sheets. This is global equities overall. And we looked over the last 30 years at price to books and the, from any individual price to book level, what was the 36-month annualized return from the market? We can see a strong downward trend here. So the more you're paying for the assets, the worse your likely return is going to be. That makes sense. The market's expensive. Obviously, at the points where it is very expensive, we always manage to tell ourselves a story as to why it should be priced like that. You know, the dot-com bubble, we're in a new world. We're prepared to pay you know, an 80 price-earnings ratio for a company that is making almost no profits because we believe its growth rate is potentially infinite. If we look where we are now, the red dot shows we're currently paying roughly a price to book of two times. If we just take that straight across to the left-hand axis, mechanistically, it would come out with a 10 or 11 percent kind of US dollar return per annum over the next three years from that price to book level. We can certainly see historically there's been a reasonable distribution from this level of price to book. But the concentration of returns from this indicator on a historic basis is still you know, in that kind of 7 to 15 percent range which relative to virtually no global inflation, I think is a pretty decent real return. And the final kind of valuation indicator that I wanted to present is, is comparing bonds and equities. So the yellow line is the prospective real return from global equities, the earnings yield. The red and the gray lines are the real yields available on German and US bonds, respectively. So we're looking at the gap between these two asset classes, asking, are they pricing a consistent fundamental framework? I've shaded on here periods of global recession. 
we would naturally expect that the gap between these two asset classes, bonds and equities, widens significantly in a time of economic downturn. Interest rates historically are cut in a time of downturn. That helps bond markets, and obviously equities tend to sell off. Company earnings are hit by falling demand. So why is it that the gap between equities and bonds currently, the real yield gap, the prospective real return, is pretty much as wide as it was in the global financial crisis when the world economy was contracting. The US economy fell by 4% that year. I think we would say this valuation gap presents an enormous buffer in terms of the potential for equity markets over the medium to long term to absorb bad news. So you may be right that the global economy is going to slow. We may have good reason to fear the impact of trade tariffs on world growth. But there is a huge amount of bad news priced into those equity markets. So to conclude, there are undoubtedly both structural and cyclical forces that would lead us to be concerned about global growth. But we would suggest the classic warning signs for a recession do not currently appear to be present. The vectors for global growth are firmly in emerging markets. And looking to the east is going to be something that we do with increasing regularity. And again, Richard Poplack is going to pick up on that shortly. And finally, how do we then construct portfolios? Well, as you saw from the markets where we're overweight, one needs a diversified basket of assets that are priced cheaply, that offer you protection against bad news, because there is plenty of reason to suspect that the latest moves will not be Trump's last, and China will retaliate. And following that, there will be something else. So you need valuation to be on your side. And over the long term, like gravity, we believe that that valuation will deliver you superior returns.